Hi, Phil. Uh, thanks for coming on, on my show. Uh, we have some interesting, important topics to talk about. We're going to touch on uh, Ukraine. We're going to touch on uh, two uh, specific topics. Uh, one is the land lease agreement, and you are going to uh, tell us about some changes in the Article 5 from NATO. So how do you want to proceed, uh, Phil, uh, those two uh, those two things? And also maybe give, a, if we start with the land lease agreement, maybe give a background <coughs> how it was used in, in the World War II and actually the application and how does it work? Okay, well, the history of the land lease agreement was essentially, for, as you point out, World War II. Uh, there was, um, the best way to describe it in modern terms for listeners is that it was essentially like a, a, a drawdown loan facility, okay, whereby, um, financial support was provided for countries to purchase uh, materials, weapons, uh, uh, and equipment that they needed during the uh, war. And many countries availed of it, the UK, um, uh, other European nations, um, uh, Russia availed of it. Um, and basically, after the war, with the restructuring of Europe, and the, the, literally the end of empires at that time, um, the Marshall Plan, uh, Bretton Woods, and everything. Essentially, the uh, loans that were taken under the land lease were repaid back over decades. Uh, some of those uh, debts have only been repaid maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, by some nations. So we jump forward to now with the implementation of land leases. It's never been done anywhere else since World War II to now. So it's, it's, it's a big deal. It's significant. It opens up uh, basically the American exchequer to fund a major war. And on this occasion, the, the name of the act is actually the Ukraine Land Lease Act. Now, what is interesting about the Land Lease Act on this occasion is that obviously, for these circumstances, for what's happening with uh, Ukraine and Russia, with the conflict, the war, with the special military operation, whichever preference people have for describing it. Essentially, it would have taken a considerable amount of time, we're talking months upon months, to draft the articles of that act to be uh, sponsored for con congressional approval, uh, Senate approval, and then um, presidential sign-off. Now, what's, when, what really becomes interesting is the timing of it. So you, you've really got a, an, an idea there in your mind that, okay, it's taken time to draft this. Um, if we work back from when it was implemented by presidential decree, that was in May of this year. So we're a couple of months into the conflict at this point in time. So it's went through its process of going through the houses in the US, the Congress and Senate. That's taken a bit of time, a few months. But when you actually look at the sponsorship date on the bill itself, it was the 19th of January of this year that that bill was sponsored to go through Congress. Now, that's a straight five weeks before the Russians actually invaded. Now, regardless of what position you take on matters, whether the Russians are the aggressor in this or the Russians were acting in a defensive manner, Either the architects or the drafters of that bill had a crystal ball and could see what the what the Russians were going to do before they did it, or they were going to draft that anyway, which was clearly the case that was drafted, obviously pre-sponsorship, uh, and that was five weeks before the actual uh, outbreak of hostilities between Russia and Ukraine. So the fact of the matter is that the Land Lease Act had obviously been planned quite some time in advance of what happened in February of this year, on the 24th of February. So if you're taking that position and you're looking at this from a analytical, clinical perspective, then there's certain questions that need to be asked about who knew what, when, and how did they know what was going to happen what the Russians' intentions were going to be or the Russian um, reaction was going to be. 
Now, if you go back to the build-up of um, Ukrainian troops along the line of contact in the Donbass, they had been essentially building up since last summer. Um, um, all the evidence was pointing towards a uh, potential offensive being prepared by the Ukrainian military. Um, as part of that process, we had the OSCE uh, Organization for Security and Cooperation of Europe, who were monitoring the contact line itself for breaches of ceasefire. And there were periodic breaches of ceasefire throughout last year by either side, uh, whether wh whoever instigated, whoever responded, there's still breaches of ceasefire. However, when we get up to January of this year, uh, starting on the 15th of January, uh, there were somewhere in the region of 40 to 45, maybe 50 maximum. This is all documented, no OSCE uh, monitoring briefs anyway. Uh, breaches of ceasefire on that particular day. On the 16th of January, that number quadrupled. Uh, it shot up to several hundred. On the 17th, that number tripled at least. It shot up to just short of a thousand or so. By the time we hit the 18th, we're over 1,500 uh, breaches per day. And we hit the 19th, the day the Lent Lease Act is sponsored. The number of breaches uh, of the ceasefire that were actually recorded by OSCE actually reached over several thousand. Now, it was around that point in time, I believe the 17th of January, where Biden made his uh, comments and statement that Russia was about to imminently invade Ukraine. So at the same time he's making that comment, the Ukrainian, and all these, actually not all, but the majority of these um, breaches of ceasefire, when we're talking artillery and mortar fire and stuff of this nature, uh, were actually instigated by the Ukrainians. So the day Biden made his statement about the imminency of Russia's invasion was one of those days when the, the Ukrainians themselves were increasing their breaches of ceasefire up into the thousands. So by the time we hit um, the, the 19th itself, like I say, there were several thousand. And this continued at that pace for around 10 or 12 days. And that's when, the, uh, around that point in time, the OSCE pulled their monitoring teams from the line of contact. And essentially they stopped monitoring what was going on. Now, um, fast forwarding to Another key event that is relative to this was uh, Zelensky's address at the uh, Munich Security uh, Conference. Now, Zelensky, when he addressed the Munich Security Con Conference, he made reference to the um, 1994 Bucharest Agreement. Uh, we can check the date, but I believe it's 1994 whereby the agreement itself, one of the principal tenets of that agreement was that um, uh, Ukraine would denuclearize because when Ukraine was created uh, then, or constituted as a nation then, it up until that point had been part of the Soviet Union, and it actually housed a large element of the Russian nuclear arsenal. So part of the agreement was that the nuclear weapons would be returned to Russia and Ukraine would remain non-nuclear. And at the Munich Security Conference, Zelensky alluded to the fact that the agreement was no longer patently working, and this was the last time that he and his country would address this issue. And in short, what he was saying was that Ukraine would consider abandoning its non-nuclear stance and status which was apparently a message directed at the Kremlin and at Putin. Uh, it was probably the, the red line not to cross. I, mean, I think this was really the, the thing that, the trigger. Uh, I mean, uh, so, I mean, basically, it was which agreement was it? Uh, Budapest or Bucharest agreement? So, basically, it was, uh, uh, there were, Ukraine was handing over the nuclear weapons to Russia at the dissolution of the USSR. And then in exchange, Russia would actually respect uh, Ukraine's sovereignty. 
I think was a uh, is it is it correct, uh, Phil? I think it's a Bucharest agreement. Bucharest yeah, agreement. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, essentially, it was it was about the denuclearization of uh, Ukraine, and um, Ukraine maintaining a uh, um, a Budapest memorandum of security assurances is the actual title of it. Okay. So, um, in light of that and Zelensky's statement, the, the, there seems to be a, a preemptive framing of conditions here, leading up through late last year particularly, um, from November, December, with the build-up of troops accelerating in Donbass, uh, the re rebuffle of um, uh, Russia's request for its own security assurances from NATO, um, then the sponsorship of the Lent Lease Act, the uh, intercept of a uh, communication signal from the commander of the Ukrainian land forces to his commanders in Donbass, tell them to pe have the preparations for the launch of the offensive ready for the 1st of March, which was intercepted by Russian intel signals intelligence. Um, I believe that that was intercepted on the 17th of January. Um, so that was again um, quite some time in advance and quite strange that a message of that magnitude would be con conveyed via a potentially compromisable uh, communication system which was evidently compromised by Russian signals intelligence. So you've got to question why such a message was conveyed so far in advance in such a manner as to advise the Russians of intent. Uh, it seems rather peculiar. I'm coming from a military background, coming from a signals background within the military intelligence. I questioned it straight away, um, the, the, the rationale or the reason or the logic for, for such a, a message to be conveyed at that particular time in that particular manner. It just smells badly to me. So you have all these different factors come into play that um, coalesced over this time period to assist the Russians in their determination of their actions, I believe. I think Russia was, Russia knew what was going on here. Uh, but Russia, I think, faced a very difficult set, set of circumstances, whether or not they should act preemptively. Because if they didn't act preemptively, they could have had 60, 70, 80,000 Ukrainians storming across through Donbass, and it would have been a bloodbath. Um, Russia would have had to come in anyway to um, protect Russian-speaking um, citizens. So they were caught between a rock and a hard place in terms of what they did, um, I believe, because of all the various pointers and indicators, combat indicators and everything else that they decided that uh, they would act preemptively. Um, I think, as you pointed out, Zelensky's statement at the Secur Munich Security Conference was probably the sort of like straw that broke the camel's back in terms of Putin's uh, deliberation on timing, and he just decided, okay, nice time to do this. But if we then look at events last year, um, which contribute to the environment that we're in now, uh, they're important to uh, bring in terms of a timeline. Uh, well, this is where I'd like to discuss Article 5 with you. Yes. NATO Article uh, 5, can you just uh, give... Uh, for our viewers, uh, just the background, how does it work, the, this NATO Article 5, what is behind this, and uh, are there any limitations, because uh, a lot of people, they they assume that Article 5 is mutual, you know, if one of the, the countries from NATO is at war, that uh, automatically they should come and, and help, but uh, is it, this is not automatic, right? Oh, no, well, there's a series of steps that would have to be implemented for, uh, or, uh, a series of steps would have to happen for it to be activated. Uh, but uh, let's just I mean, basically talk about the, the purpose of Article 5 is, as you say, it is the mutual um, defense aspect of the um, the article itself, which is the important part. Uh, in short, it's what it says is an attack against one is an attack against all. So therefore, if one NATO member is involved in uh, an aggressive, uh, uh, or the victim of an aggressive attack by a non-NATO member, 
then the other NATO members are obliged under Article 5 to come to their assistance and aid. Now, whether that be like what we're witnessing in Ukraine, who is not a member of NATO, but NATO is pouring in weapons in the billions of dollars, obviously. Well, we just talked about the Land Lease Act. What we didn't talk about was the value that's been allocated to the Land Lease Act with the Ukrainians is 39.5 billion, but the overall expenditures, it's, it's the ceiling of it so far is $55 billion. How much of that's actually been spent is, is it's not anywhere near that amount. The, the total sum of the Land Lease Act itself is, I think, $39.4 billion. But so far, there has already been about $7.5 billion expended on Ukraine. So this is where Article 5 is interesting because the assistance could come from certain nations by weapon support, or it could actually be complete mobilization of their militaries under the NATO um, uh, structure. Now, where Article 5 becomes interesting is it was limited by geographical scope historically. And it's in the name, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So therefore, the geographical scope of Article 5 had always historically been limited to within that geographical definition. However, the first time that it had been activated was actually in the aftermath of 9-11, where it was perceived that America had been a victim of an attack. No, that... Uh, not, not perceived, but they were a victim of an attack. But per the perception then was used to invoke Article 5. So when Afghanistan was invaded, when they were going after the uh, Al-Qaeda network, that's when NATO deployed alongside America. And it was because of the activation of Article 5 that they were able to be deployed and become involved for the next 20 years in the conflict in Afghanistan. So in February of 2021, a motion was put forward in, within NATO for the revision of Article 5. Uh, there were two key elements that were to be revised. Uh, one of them was technical level, the other on geographical level. So and we'll deal with technical level uh, after we talk about the geographical aspect of it. So the geography of it was to be expanded beyond its historic um, precepts of uh, uh, the North Atlantic. And that expansion would include the Indo-Pacific region, okay? So specifically, specifically, do you, have a, do you have a country? Would it be like uh, Australia and Japan? Do you have a specific countries there? Oh, no, we'll come back to that. Uh, the, uh, we're talking about geography here, geographical yeah. expansion of the existing NATO family and framework Got it. Yeah. to yeah. geographically cover beyond the North Atlantic region, where they have historically operated in Europe, to include the Indo-Pacific, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so arguably, they had already extended outside of their traditional sphere of oper operation because of the conflict in Afghanistan, and they're, they're coming to the aid of America at that point in time. But it hadn't, nothing had been ratified or changed um, legally within NATO for that to happen. It was just an activation of Article 5 at that point in time and um, the aftermath of 9-11 attacks. So this was an actual modification and, and um, change to the, essentially, the constitution of NATO, basically, to expand it geographically beyond um, Europe, the North Atlantic, and, 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 and extend into the Indo-Pacific. So you have that geographical aspect of it. The second aspect was the introduction of cyber attacks as being a an activator for the in, in, invoking Article 5. So technically, any country that comes under, any NATO member that comes under a cyber attack can actually invoke Article 5 and NATO can mobilize against whoever that enemy might be. So if, for example, uh, if Russia executed a cyber attack against Germany, then Article 5 could be invoked and NATO would declare war, war against Russia for uh, uh, a cyber attack. 
uh, now that they've expanded geographically the scope of NATO to include the Indo-Pacific region, arguably China or North Korea, if we're perceived to be uh, responsible for a cyber attack against any NATO member, they could invoke Article 5 uh, mutual defense and declare their war with the other nation. Now, it's a timeline of it which is interesting again because, as I said, the proposal was initially put forward in February of 2021. Now, at the, the period of time leading into that, uh, starting in 2018, we had the announcement, and I believe the UK was one of the first countries to start with this, was the release of their Indo-Pacific strategy on, on a national level. And then you had various other countries following suit, like Italy, Italy and France, etc., etc., releasing their individual uh, Indo-Pacific strategies for their national interests. And then last year, we had the EU release an Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, the EU doesn't have a navy, it doesn't have an air force, it doesn't have an army. So you'd wonder what, how or why the EU would have an Indo-Pacific strategy. And we're talking a defence strategy here. Okay? So when you actually home in on it and press a few buttons with senior political figures within the EU, and you question them about why the EU has an Indo-Pacific strategy when it doesn't have the necessary mechanisms supported through Navy, Army, Air Force, military, whatever. They just simply don't have it. Then they just shrug their shoulders that, well, we're all members of NATO. So therefore, by default, it was a NATO strategy. So, and those strategies, as I say, were released between 2018 through to last year. And then last year you had the modification take place, the proposal for it in February of 2021, and the actual um, ratification of that took place right after the G7 summit in the UK. All the uh, participants swanned off to um, Brussels for their NATO summit. Um, it was at that summit that Article 5 was actually adopted. The modifications to Article 5 were adopted, the, the geographic and cyber aspect of it. So when you look at the timeline of it, the individual nation states releasing their Indo-Pacific strategies and then bodies like the EU releasing theirs. And at the same time, you had countries like Australia, New Zealand, um, obviously America, whatnot, releasing their Indo-Pacific strategies. strategies. Then at the same time, you have to look at the next aspect of it, the cyber side of it. Now, um, uh, from 2018 onwards, um, a couple of countries were invited to take part in cyber exercises with uh, NATO. Um, it just so happens that, obviously, uh, Ukraine was one of those countries. Um, Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, I understand, also, and uh, South Korea. Now, fast forward from that period of time, these exercises take place, I think, uh, once a year at least. I, I, don't, I don't think they're by yearly. I, I, I think they're uh, a yearly exercise. Uh, fast forward until March of this year, and a formal invitation was extended to Ukraine. Finland, Sweden, Switzerland, and South Korea to become members, fully fledged members of the CDG, which is Cyber Defense Group of NATO. I don't know what Switzerland's position is, but the other four have accepted the invitation to join um, the Cyber Defense Group. Now, given the fact that the modifications have been made already and accepted and ratified last year, to Article 5, the inclusion of these nations, who none of them are members of NATO, within that cyber defense group, should actually raise people's eyebrows because it is a de facto stealth expansion of NATO. Now, those same five nations have all been invited to attend the NATO summit at the end of this month in Madrid as non 
uh, NATO um, participants. But it's not just them who have been invited. There are several other nations who have been invited. And they include um, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan. Uh, so that brings us up to, and I don't know what, uh, again, I don't know what Switzerland's actual position on this is. Um, they seem to have been wavering lately in terms of uh, enforcement of sanctions and stuff against Russia. So whether or not they have accepted the offer for the membership of the CDG, I'm not sure, but I know for, for sure South Korea, Sweden, Finland, and Ukraine have. But then... We, we should be surprised by Sweden and Finland. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people probably didn't realize that Sweden and Finland were included in the cyber defense group before their um, invitation or request to join NATO were made. So, yes, starting to see a protracted um, engineering or architecturing of a gradual incremental expansion of NATO by stealth, using various uh, mechanisms to achieve that. Now, what comes off this summit at the end of June, there is clearly going to be some kind of major pronouncement. Um, one of those pronouncements, I think, was... Um, uh, is it the Charter? Um, uh, something more strategic than the Charter, I think. Um, let me see, NATO Summit of 20, I'm just checking some notes here, if you don't mind. If you want to jump in there, Angela, while I check these notes, because I, I want to be no, specific. Uh, no, I, it's interesting to, uh, when, when uh, in actually people, they, they tend to think about NATO as being uh, the defined countries that actually are uh, in, within NATO, but actually they are also unfold. Uh, countries that informally are already the de facto into NATO. I mean, uh, Ukraine is the first one. Uh, they have uh, NATO bases, they have NATO training, um, they have NATO weapons. So de facto Ukraine is already NATO, into NATO. So Finland and Sweden, it's the sort of same. They are cooperation. They, they, they probably are lots of, there are lots of exchanges between NATO and those countries. Uh, so it was just a matter of time for those countries to enter into NATO and or just to formalize. So there's a there's an informal uh, element into NATO. So it is wider than just those, you know, the the, the one that already signed into this uh, this association. Uh, then I'm going just I can give just a small update. I mean, uh, there's there's this problem with Finland and Sweden. I think you followed, right? Uh, well, you mm -hmm. have Turkey, which is giving its conditions, and this could, could be a blowback, big blowback. I mean, imagine if Finland and Sweden are not able to join NATO, well, they would, they will have lost their actual neutrality de facto. Addition to yeah. that, they wouldn't be to NATO, and they would be, uh, they wouldn't benefit from Article Five. So you see the huge humiliation. I mean, political well, uh, humiliation. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, this this has presented a, a more than a technical problem. It's presented a moral problem now because Turkey uh, Turkey does what's in the best interest of Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> they are hard and, to read. Uh, if 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 someone can really understand Turkey, I mean, this is probably one of the most difficult countries to understand. The well, game actually, they playing, the game they playing. I, I don't know. It's just. Uh, uh, talk about strategic strategic ambiguity. That that is Turkey. But but I think oh, yeah, ultimately definitely. ultimately you know what I think is Turkey is doing this the game uh, to NATO that Hungary is doing to EU. So basically, you might be against, but the only way you can influence is by being inside it. So well, I mean, you know, Tur Turkey has decades of resentment built up because of its exclusion from uh, the EU. And it's been treated as a, like a second-class oh, yeah. uh, member of NATO. Although, realistically, when you look at it, it has, at this point in time, I believe Turkey has the largest standing army in NATO. And it after, is the... Yeah. Um, after the US. After the US, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, army personnel or... Uh, oh, well, yeah, well, I mean, within the NATO, 
European side of it. Uh, Turkey yeah. is by far the largest. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, I always think of America as being a rather large island on the other side of the world. So <laughs> I'm talking about the European context. Um, Turkey yeah. is the largest stand, uh, military within NATO. Um, but the fact that they've been excluded for, for so long from uh, inclusion in the EU or membership of the EU, and yet we see all the efforts being made and driven and pushed to get Ukraine in as a member of the EU. So Turkey's resentment has been long deep seated in this respect. Um, look, they have their own agenda. Play. Um, I'm not surprised by some of their actions, to be quite frank. Uh, uh, it's a perfect time for Turkey to uh, make some gains in this respect. Um, uh, they played the cards very well. I mean, they've also got a balanced relationship with Russia. So. Uh, they tread a fine line, but they tread it very well. Um, so yeah. Well, it reminds me. Uh, you you know this book. I mean, uh, the clash of civilization, Huntington, and actually Turkey is one of those countries that, that are actually between those civilization, major civilizations. You know, and when there's China, there's a orthodox world. There's a the 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 Catholic Europe. Uh, those different worlds. And, and oh, you're Turkey, talking about Turkey, uh, hunt, Huntington. Huntington, Samuel yeah. Huntington. Yeah, yeah, it was one of the countries that was just in between. They could actually play the the bridging between the, those worlds, you know. And and uh, and I don't know what is the, the aspiration of Erdogan. He's got, he's got ambitions, and he's right to do what he's doing. And actually, well, imagine just if he wants to be expelled or not expelled. You cannot be expelled by from NATO, but. If he, if Turkey decided to go get out of NATO, then it might actually become long term to become a, a target. I mean, keep in mind that in 2016, the U.S. actually tried to do a coup in Turkey uh, mm -hmm. against Erdogan. He was the Gulen movement, which is actually controlled from the U.S. Uh, and, and again, uh, they they actually uh, Turkey is being attacked also by the funding of, of those Kurds uh, independent move independentist movements. Why do you think they are those movements are located into Finland or Sweden? Why? Because those countries are not into NATO. If yeah, they were exactly. into NATO, they would, it would be a problem. They chose those two countries because because they knew it wouldn't be a problem. They're not into yeah, NATO. it wouldn't it wouldn't create an embarrassing situation yeah, for exactly. NATO because they're they were using uh, Finland and uh, Sweden to funnel money to these organizations and groups and everything and support them. Uh, were, had they been NATO members, then that would have been a very difficult situation created for NATO. Well, it's the same, it's the same as the Fethullah Gulen movement, which was behind the coup in 2016. You know, uh, the, where, where, where are, is, is this guy, this guru, I don't know, I mean, it's just a, he's, a, he's a cleric. I think he's a cleric located is, is in the US is protected by the US well actually his sponsor was a uh, the, the, the man who sponsored his citizenship in the US uh, he lives in Pennsylvania actually uh, he was also one of the chief architects of the Ark of Chaos no so th that history there goes back a long way between um, Gulen's network and the Americans. So, uh, look, one of the first things Turkey did was to try and dismantle as much of Gulen's network across the world as it possibly could. And obviously it hit across uh, Central Asia down into South Asia down into Southeast Asia. It was an extensive network. And they've actually systematically dismantled, uh, I would say probably now, physically 80% of it. Uh, in terms of schools, madrasas, and stuff like this here. And uh, th there are schools who are actually like elite leadership schools. This, these weren't like madrasas for the uh, the poor, the needy, and stuff like this here. These were, uh, uh, it was a selection process, basically, where they're grooming the leadership of the um, Gulen network for the future. So, and that's what Turkey went after on an intelligence level when they were shutting down that network. So, yeah, but Turkey's got its own problems relative to this as well, and the Uyghurs and everything else. So uh, again, that's a probably a good subject for another discussion. At another Absolutely. Time. Yeah, let's uh, um, let's not lose track. Uh, so just those, those two links, maybe Article Five in this land lease agreement, and the timing, timing. Uh, yeah, okay, just just come back to that time and um, 
when you finish off with the um, um, ratification of it uh, in June of last year, and then it was from then onwards that the obviously the groundwork was being laid for the invitations for uh, Sweden and Finland and Ukraine and Switzerland and South Korea. So I, I believe at this NATO summit in a little over eight days, nine days, um, is actually going to be quite significant in terms of the betting down and probably a major announcement about NATO's Indo-Pacific involvement. And I think it's no coincidence the fact that there's four Indo-Pacific nations taking part in that summit in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Japan, and South Korea. That is not by uh, accident or coincidence or anything. This is intentional. So um, I suspect we're going to see something major in terms of the hardening and solidification of position relative to the China-Taiwan issue. So, and plus, if you look at what the Americans are doing, the build-up. There's another interesting thing which is happening right now at the moment, which... Again, I, 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 it can't be a coincidence, okay? <laughs> the Montero uh, um, Summit Conference normally takes place between the U.S. and Taiwan on strategic defense issues in the last quarter of the year. This year, it's taking place right now, this week, in America. So it's been moved forward by at least 10, 12 weeks, if, maybe even 14 weeks. So there's something quite significant because it's the first time it's been moved in terms of its date. So that's going to be quite a significant development. And the fact that it's happening right before this NATO summit again gives credence to the, the prospects of something significant relative to the Asia Pacific, Indo Pacific, uh, China, Taiwan, possibly emanating from this NATO summit. So that, that really caught my attention that that's. Um, Taiwan American summit being moved forward to the middle of the year from the last quarter of the year. So there has to be a reason for that. Um, I believe it's whatever business they're discussing and, and agreeing on, it has to be agreed before this NATO summit uh, on what is going to be agreed and comes out of that. Absolutely. It's, uh, I think, uh, I mean, as far as uh, I think uh, when it comes to Taiwan, I would give it a, a timeline like any time from now to the next two years. I think the critical time is uh, the fact that Taiwan from the DPP, the pro-independence party, uh, they, she's doing a second term, second and last term. And there's a lit, I think there's a little chance that she, they, they will elect another president from this party. So let's say if in 2024, the Kuomintang candidate is elected, the probability of having Taiwan to side, keep on siding with the US, completely with the US and against China, <coughs> uh, yep. you know, it's, it's about, you know, it, it just depends on, on who's going to be elected. And uh, I would give it a probably 50, 50%. Chances and, and so so if if Kuomintang, uh, a candidate is elected, the chances will be zero. So it's now or never really. And the timing is and, and also keep in mind that uh, China is getting stronger. They have this uh, counterpart power projection. You know, defense forces they're getting really strong. There's a you know the shipbuilding. They they're getting strong, much much. I mean, stronger. It's not the China of uh, 10 years ago. And every year that pass by, it will be, this window of opportunity will get shorter and will be more difficult to contain China. You know, I, I'm not, I'm, I don't think it's necessarily about attacking China. It's more containment and pushing China to, you know, to hopefully to be isolated. But, uh, but you see, I mean, did Russia get isolated? No, on the contrary, it's more the West that got isolated. I, uh, well, I mean, it, it, look, if it, just just dealing on, on that particular aspect very quickly before I jump back on to what you just said. Look, it's patently obvious that Russia had been anticipating uh, some kind of outbreak of hostilities and actions from the West for quite some time. 
because they have uh, insulated themselves quite effectively from these sanctions. Now, you can also argue that uh, this is where the delusion, um, the misinformation, disinformation, and outright lying in the West, that they've convinced themselves of uh, the failure of Russia as a nation state, uh, which goes back decades uh, in terms of the entrenchment of that perception as Russia being the, the great evil communist enemy and everything. Um, this delusion has actually come, it's backfiring on them. And I mean, this uh, woke virtue signaling that took place at the initial stages of conflict with all the, the, the weaponization of commerce, um, companies pulling out and everything, and that was expected to deliver some kind of body blow to the Russian economy. All this delusion has now really come back to bite them because they're starting to realize that Russia was and is, is still an independent sovereign nation and is not dependent upon the West. Now, the problem we're looking at here uh, in Asia uh, with China, China is probably much more greatly integrated into the global economic system. Now, if we look at the ongoing uh, program that's taking place by the West, it's, in my perspective, it's a multi-dimensional, um, uh, multi-layered, asymmetrical hybrid war that's being waged against China. Taiwan is a mechanism to initiate potentially similar actions against China that was initiated against Russia. Now, the Chinese not being um, silly about things and quite alert to everything, they've obviously been preparing themselves for the eventuality of this themselves anyway, just like Russia has done so. But the West will go ahead anyway. They're, 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 they're deluding themselves into believing that they can actually bring down the Chinese government, the Chinese economy. And Taiwan is, uh, like Hong Kong was a collateral damage in the objective of destabilizing uh, the one country, two systems, which would have been the model of employment, of governance for Taiwan if there was to be a uh, reconciliation between, peaceful reconciliation between Taiwan and China. So the attacks and everything that happened in Hong Kong was about, in my opinion, destroying the one country, two systems, undermining its credibility, so therefore it wouldn't be usable as a model for Taiwan. That was one stage of it. Other stages of it are essentially the time frame you mentioned um, about Chinese naval capabilities. Just this week, we had the launch of China's uh, third aircraft carrier. Um, and of course, there's a hullabaloo in the Western media about it. And uh, if you just look at the language used to describe the aircraft carrier, it's like something that has risen from the depths of hell. It's uh, it's about to unleash <laughs> fury across the Western world. And it's like, yeah, it's like, uh, did South Korea not release one or launch one last year sometime, if I'm correct? I don't recall it being described as something coming from the depths of hell. But anyway, um, that's uh, the third aircraft carrier. China's objective is to have five carrier fleets. Now, it, depending on what source you go to, some of the sources say by 2035 this was an aspiration or desire of Chinese to have this. Others say 2030. More realistically, at the pace of developments, when I first started looking at China's uh, naval developments, it was about uh, 12 years ago. And I knew then that they had aspirations for five carriers, but didn't know how long the time frame would be for delivery of that. But frankly, this one, according to various sources, this one is two years ahead of schedule in terms of the Western understanding. Now, you take that with a pinch of salt because the Western understanding could be completely wrong. And in many cases regarding China, it is completely wrong. But in this case, of this one is two years ahead. It's only two years ahead in the water. It still has to be integrated into the, uh, the fleet. It still has to be, uh, be crewed, training, uh, interoperability, and, and the rest of the battle group has to be assembled. So, look, it's going to be sea trials now. It could be two months in sea trials. It could be six months before it becomes operational as a fleet. But in terms of the timing, they're already working on the fourth one. Uh, I don't know what stage you're up with the fifth one, but apparently it's either it's probably going to be number five is going to be a nuclear powered carrier. Now, if you look at 
their fin aspirations are quite interesting. I mean, they're also building eight Type 075 landing craft. Now, those vessels, the best way to describe those are min miniature aircraft carriers. They're very similar to what the J Japanese have, okay, in terms of tonnage um, and usage. Now, the Japanese have just converted theirs uh, over the past couple of years from what their original alleged purpose was, which was helicopter carriers, to now fully-fledged aircraft carriers, which was a sort of stealth way of getting around their, uh, their own limitations through the Constitution. So the Chinese are developing eight of these at the same time. Now, even if we have three carriers in the sea as carrier groups, and we have maybe four of these Type 075s, that gives you essentially seven air, uh, aircraft carrier vessels of differing uh, scales and sizes. You've got then the South China Sea assets, which are, for want of a better description, anchored aircraft carriers, firmly fixed aircraft carriers. And they're there for defensive purposes. So if you add those to the um, emerging capabilities, you're reaching a tipping point, possibly before 2024, of China being able to uh, deny U.S. Um, aerial denial of China in the South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, and in the Pacific, and, and certainly under the Indian Ocean as well. So I think you're right in terms of your timing, um, but I don't think it's 2025. I think we're looking at a escalation before that, because the, what, the one thing the Americans cannot do here is to allow this to reach tipping point and past. That window was closing for American uh, dominance of um, the Indo-Pacific in terms of naval capabilities. And once China hits a tipping point, there is no turning back. The only way to turn this back is to decimate the Chinese naval capabilities before they reach that tipping point. Because it changes the entire strategic part of, of the first island chain, the second island chain. It no longer becomes about containment of China. Um, if the tipping point is reached. And I think we're closing more rapidly on that tipping point than what the Western strategists actually believed or thought. If people were banking on it being 2035 or 2030, they're out by at least a decade. And therefore, I think this is why we're seeing an acceleration of aggression and posturing with China over Taiwan. Because they need to draw China over its own red line. And this is where I think the mistake has been made. But, I mean... It's a, maybe it's not the right way to describe it, but I mean, Russia drew its red lines with Ukraine. It was forced over its own red lines. China has drawn its red lines with Taiwan. And that's precisely where the West, America, NATO, European nations see the Achilles heel, is to force China over its own red line on Taiwan. And therefore, they can apportion blame and responsibility for what comes next firmly and squarely on China. Although it's they, they who are being the aggressors and pushing China towards crossing that red line, but history they want they want history to judge China as being the aggressor, just like history is judging Russia as being the aggressor. So this is why the window of opportunity is closing rapidly for the Americans to act against China relative to its naval capabilities as well. And it's beyond that. I mean, their missile capabilities are obviously hugely, massively uh, advanced in the past deck here as well yeah yeah it's uh so you agree with me i mean we, we're talking about the window that uh probably the west is panicking right now is it's now or never so every month that pass by it's uh it's, it's going to be more difficult but but even still i still believe that even though even if the the west was to attack china uh tomorrow it would lose i mean there were some uh, game they, they try to do some simulation quite a few times, uh, and, and mm -hmm. every time, every time, the they failed the attack, every time. They would fail every time, right? But then, if you look at like uh, people, like strategic advisors, like Colbridge, uh, 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 what's his name, El, El, Colbridge Elby, uh, um, he was one of Trump's strategic advisors. Um, worked with. Um, Oh, 
I think he reports to Pompeo. I'm, I'm, I can't remember. I need to check. But uh, Coleridge Elby, um, he essentially uh, was one of the architects of uh, the U.S. Um, defense strategy relative to Ch uh, Taiwan, China. And if you look at what he says in his book that he published last year, um, essentially the, the, he talks about the act, the actual people of Taiwan being used as collateral damage intentionally to turn public opinion against China. And, and how he proposes doing that is to make sure that there's uh, insufficient air defense coverage given and civilians become collateral damage. And it'll just make the Chinese look bad. And I find it amazing the, the, the magnitude of the misinformation and propaganda that has uh, emanated from this uh, Ukraine conflict has been breathtaking in the severity of it, the scale of it, the, the absolute utter nonsense that in cases come out. It's just unbelievable uh, messaging being peddled. That's what we're seeing in Ukraine. What can we expect to see here in Asia if it moves to conflict over Taiwan? The, the level of disinformation, misinformation, um, lying is going to be off the charts. And if we think it's bad for Ukraine, it's going to be much yeah. worse here. I think so too. I, I think uh, additional to that, the, you, you've seen the Russophobia and how extreme it got. I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's hysterical. I think it's going to be much, much worse when it will come to Chinese. And, and the problem is that uh, many people in the West, they don't even differentiate uh, Asia. So I think there will be, I mean, races will be enhanced. And I wouldn't be surprised that they do the same as the, the U.S. did to Japanese. I mean, uh, it couldn't be, get as bad as that. Well, I, mean, I was just reading something today, actually. Yeah. AP News, uh, I was reading it a few hours ago. Um, released a article saying spy agencies, U.S. spy agencies, focus on China would probably snare Chinese Americans. And essentially, what the article is talking about is that um, the uh, a new report is saying that um, U.S. intelligence agencies will ramp up their efforts against China. Top officials have acknowledged that this may end up collecting more phone calls and email data and information from Chinese Americans raising new concerns about spying and effect on civil liberties. So uh, this is just out today in AP, and it's like two paragraphs long uh, article. And you're reading it and you're like, well, is that a warning or is it information? It sounds like a warning. It sounds like they're telling Chinese Americans that, you know, be prepared because you're probably going to become victims of uh, intrusion here. Your phones will be tapped, your emails, you, and as you say, that they could start rounding people up, for God's sakes. The level of uh, anti-China, anti-Asian sentiment is much longer entrenched than the anti-Russian um, sentiments. Absolutely. I, mean, I think there's, there's even a much bigger budget, by the way. You know, this uh, a propaganda arm from the U.S. is a U.S. AGM, right? You're familiar with that. It's, uh, they, yes. they finance. <laughs> It's very complex, but they finance and that indirectly, uh, you know, sect uh, Falun Gong, they finance uh, Radio Frisia, etc. I mean, many, uh, they finance a lot of even independent uh, uh, media, but the budget, yearly budget is one billion US dollar. Uh, just China alone on the Belt and Road Initiative, there's a budget of 300 million dollars per year on demonizing China on the Belt mm -hmm. and Road Initiative. And probably I would I think it's, there's probably 500 million for China altogether. In oh, it's more. Than, it's actually more than that. I, I went through the probably. bill. Yeah. I, I was I was actually tallying up um, different elements of it because USGM uh, and other organizations within this permit structure, USGM's at the top, and then underneath you get like the NED, they get the OTF, and they're all in. They're all spun off. And they're all they got their own separate budgets. Yeah. So what's uh, and it's con congressional appropriate budgets that they have. So Congress is financing all of this. So this is American taxpayers' money being used to finance uh, disinformation, misinformation, propaganda campaigns against countries. And the, I mean the likes of the OTF. I looked at them during the 2019 uh, Hong Kong protests because uh, they were funding elements of the 
crypt testing in Hong Kong in terms of communications and encryption and stuff of that nature, which are o integrally OTF involved in. Yeah, just feel OTF uh, stands for Open Technology Fund, right? Open Technology Fund, yeah. Yeah. Um, now their budget for I looked at their budget for 2019, and it it ran a PDF of 1,700 pages. <laughs> it was like I know. good lord, it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Uh, and it was spun out as a, a separate entity in 2015, around the middle of 2015. They they actually, up until that point, they'd been under the sort of like management stewardship of Radio Free Asia, um, and they were reporting to NED, uh, and then they spun them out. So that budget of a one billion, that's the, the budget for one organisation. OTF have got a separate budget now. So when you take all these budgets collectively. For the Asia Pacific disinformation aspect, we're looking at about four point seven billion dollars over the next five years. This, I mean, that that ridiculous amount of money. Um, it's uh, and the damage that's going to inflict is going to be lasting. So, um, I mean, there's many different things to talk about here. I mean, we could probably have another call. And discuss Absolutely. a more yeah. sort of like strategic perspective of all this because events like the um, Democracy Summit in December last year, where the Americans decided who were invited and who wasn't invited, essentially. And it was about polarization, it was about uh, partitioning of the world into either perceived democratic countries or non democratic countries. So. But the impact of that has been a lot of the civil society organizations that were participating in that democracy summit are direct beneficiaries of this funding that we're talking about here. So all this stuff has to be looked at. And I mean, it was within months of that uh, democracy summit happening that the polarization relative to Russia's uh, actions on Ukraine actually demonstrated just how polarized the world was in respect to for and against uh, America's position and Russia's position on, on all of this. So, yeah, we should do another discussion purely. I mean, I wrote an article about the Democracy Summit back in December, actually, around the time of the summit. I, I published an article on it. So. Um, but, yeah, strategically, it, it's all tied in together. So we'll have to have a, a, a sort of good yeah. top top-down view of it all. Yeah, Phil, we're getting close to one hour. I think uh, one of the topics we could have maybe is just to, you know, for, for next time is to talk about those two fronts. I mean, Ukraine and Taiwan. We need to get back to this and uh, how do they want to, to get organized with that? I mean, who will be on board? There will be two fronts. I was thinking the EU on one front mainly. I mean, uh, having European blood to be spilled for the US. And for Asia, Asian blood, there would be... Korea, Japan, and and Australia. And, well, Australia be straight in there. there are no questions asked. Uh, don't stop to collect anything. Just uh, run, yeah. run on in there like Gallipoli. Yeah. yeah. All right, Phil. Phil, let's let's uh, let's keep it for next time. But it was a very nice to talk to you, and I think we should do this again. It was a great pleasure. Absolutely, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. I'll talk Thank to you, you very soon. much. Thank you. Bye bye.